And joining us now on the debate, Philip Cross, Senior Fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute. Derek Burlton, Vice President, Deputy Chief Economist with the TD Bank Financial Group. Moshe Malevsky, Professor, York University and Executive Director at the IFID Center. That's a non-profit corporation that researches personal finance. And Gail Vazoxlade, television and radio broadcaster and author of Debt Free Forever. Welcome, everybody, to the program. Nice to be here. A little special one for you. We used to call you GVO on TVO, you know? You we, always did. I always did when you yeah. did your program here many moons ago. Let's get this started because the governor of the bank, as I suggested in the opening, Mark Carney, has repeatedly warned he may have to raise interest rates in the future because he regards household debt, which is running at a near record 152% of disposable income, as the number one domestic risk to the Canadian economy. So let's figure out, first of all, Gail, you first. Why is this level of household debt considered so troublesome? Well, you know, once upon a time, we used to live within our means and save something. Now we save nothing and we spend money we haven't made yet. So that's what debt is. Debt is income we haven't yet earned, spent often on frivolous things. So big screen televisions, cars that are bigger than we should have, more special, uh, new wardrobes and renovations. I mean, everybody needs a granite countertop in their kitchen now. <laughs> And the end result is that we can't manage our cash flows anymore because so much of our disposable income is going to pay interest. We're not even thinking about repaying the debt. We're just thinking about keeping up. Derek, do you agree the amount of debt Canadians are carrying on average is troublesome? Uh, yes, it is. It's certainly concerning, I think, for two reasons. I think if you look at uh, what little data we have on things like debt service costs, the affordability of debt, um, Canadians, by and large, can afford their debt at the moment, uh, but that's at current interest rates. And the problem is that these rates won't remain at these levels forever. And I think a lot of Canadians haven't been around the last time, time rates were very high, so they, they forget about things, but rightly so. Uh, the other thing is on the, the asset side, that you know, if you look at measures like debt to asset ratios, they're not too far out of whack, but the problem is that uh, you know, if you listen to people like myself, other forecasters, that housing prices can go up and down in value, asset prices can go up and down in value, but the problem is that debt doesn't tend to. So if we do get a correction in housing, which is, which is reasonable to forecast at some point, then a lot of Canadians are going to see their net worth plummet, and that can have some very negative economic implications. So if you're Mark Carney, you know, you're worried about this, but you're also worried about the impact on the economy down the road, and, and that's why he's warning and warning. He's not quite ready to use the interest rate tool yet, but he's certainly warning that he could. Moshe, should he be as concerned as he says he is? Well, I think on average the numbers don't look good. Uh, obviously the 152 number that you quoted is something that was very close to what was happening in the U.S. before the crisis, and people are concerned that the same thing would happen here. I think that the sensitivity that people have isn't just to interest rates. What really worries me is not just interest rates going up, it's a shock to people's uh, income, you know, unemployment, uh, a shock to their uh, daily lifestyle, uh, an illness, uh, something unexpected. That worries me more than interest rate increases. That's why I don't think interest rates are really the lever by which this could actually unfold. It would be more a question of unemployment increasing that would be a problem, uh, people individually having a shock to their personal balance sheet that would impact things. But yeah. certainly the average numbers don't look very good. Is that to suggest that if, un excuse me, that if interest rates go up a few points, we could potentially handle it as a nation in terms of the personal debt we're carrying, Philip? I think there's two things to separate here to answer that question. One is if interest rates go up, are a certain number of households will be uh, at risk. That's uh, the microeconomics of this. The macro of this, though, is are, are there enough of those people out there who could potentially be in trouble to bring down major financial institutions like happened in the U.S.? I don't think we're anywhere near uh, to that point. No. Okay, but you know what? This isn't really just about people. Because well, people, people are at risk. Rate from major financial mm, institutions. Okay. Though. People are at risk. People are at real risk in terms of the amount of debt they've been allowed to have. How do people get the amount of credit that they're getting? And I believe that the primary problem is the credit scoring system. When we imported the credit scoring system from the US into Canada and we totally dumped credit adjudication, so we stopped qualifying people based on their character and their capacity and a number of other characteristics. Um, what we ended up doing was we ended up creating this false sense of people being able to manage credit when really all they're managing is minimum payments. I was going to get to this later, but while we're on it right now, okay, we should get the guy from the big bank to respond to this. Do, do, you, do you push more credit at people, not you personally, but you know, the big banks in general, do they push more credit at people than people can handle? 
Well, what's happened is we've been responding to uh, an environment of ultra-low interest rates. The fact that Canadian economy has remained sound, that demand for credit has been rising. Now, those rates being as low as they've been, we've been through a very unusual time, and uh, the, uh, the Bank of Canada governor would argue that uh, he's had to leave rates lower for longer because a lot of these developments globally and the credit crisis in, in 08, 09. So uh, my response to that is that, uh, you know, banks, financial institutions in general have been responding to what is very significant demand. They've done so in a very financially responsible way, in my view, because if you look around the world, well, you know, our banks are, by the World Economic Forum, rated the soundest. We stress test our books all the time for things like a 25% decline in home prices. We're still sound. So, you know, there's still very much a regulatory framework in place, and uh, we get lauded quite a bit. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect. Well, what's hogwash about what he said? Yeah. Well, how do you explain a 21-year-old man earning $24,000 a year getting a $16,000 balance on a credit card. They know who his parents are. No. no, no, that's not it at all because his mother doesn't have any money either, but your bank gave him a credit card with a $16,000 limit. And the reason was he had two previous credit cards from other financial institutions on which he was making the minimum payments. He had a fabulous credit score, hmm. okay? But there is no way in anybody's world that boy could ever be expected to repay. How typical is that? Very typical based on what I'm seeing. I see it all the time. I analyze people's finances. Okay, let's hear from it. Well, and, I, and, I, and admittedly, we, we do have some issues. I mean, we'll talk about if rates even go up two points, a good 10% of households in Canada, about one million, are going to be in a position of financial stress. So this is a systemic thing. It's not due to financial institutions. It's not due to the Bank of Canada governor, the regulators, households. It's due to everybody. And it's really something that this is why we've got to face some of these issues. In terms of the regulation, I mean, this is a non going thing. The, the bank regulator is looking at implementing new re regulations, particularly on lines of credit next year. So the situation's unfolding, and I think there's a recognition that we've got to respond to some of these challenges. So I'm, I'm just curious, to Gil, you think that the bank has an obligation other than making sure they're going to get repaid? No. <laughs> well, but they're going to they're going to get repaid that sixteen thousand dollar loan. No, they're not. Loan. You no, don't they're not. no they went. wouldn't have made the loan. No, no, that's not true. They made the loan and they didn't get repaid because he yeah. went into um, bankruptcy. But that's doesn't. an exception. Okay. I don't think no, they're going to no, be making those not, loans on not. a regular basis. But they do make the loans on a regular yeah. basis. That's exactly my point because yeah. I see it all the time. So you're saying they're making stupid loans. All the time. Yeah. Based okay. on that's a crappy credit. Believe. Hang on. How can they be making so much money if they're making so many stupid loans? Because right now credit has been so easy to get that what people are doing, and you're not seeing it because you're not analyzing at the individual level, is they're borrowing more money to make the minimum payments on everything else. That's the only way you can have a gentleman who makes $38,000 a year as a doorman have access to a hundred thousand dollars worth of credit sure. over 18 credit sure. cards every time he needs a okay. new card Stand by. he applies Philip come on in this is uh, why drawing my sister's Canada background now I distrust anecdotes I think you know because you can always find something that proves your case if we look at the aggregate statistics on bankruptcies, for example, we saw that yes, there was an acceleration of household debt over the 2000s, and yet the bankruptcy rate was very stable until the recession hit. Right. The recession pushed some people into bankruptcy, and that's now coming back down. Right. But there's no evidence that the debt per se was being pushed out the door onto unwilling victims who and, couldn't handle And how many people are so close to bankruptcy right now that only a small change having their hours cut at work, having one shift cut, would actually shove them over the edge. Right, but, but in the current climate, I don't think that number is all that high. Now you're right, if we go through an economic shock, if for some reason Europe blows up and there's a huge financial shock wave, I do worry about it, because a lot of Canadians, even based on the aggregate data, are close to the line. Let Very me, close to the line. Let me Very, read this, gang. This was from the Globe and Mail a couple of months ago and see if this helps propel our conversation a little bit. For all of the talk about Canada's sky-high household debt loads, you don't see much action from Canada's banks. In fact, for a brief moment there, Bank of Montreal led a charge that forced a number of them, including Royal Bank of Canada and Toronto Dominion Bank, to lower their mortgage rates below 3%. Take a look at the bank's portfolios as outlined in a recent Moody's report and you'll understand why. For credit cards, Canadians' payment rates are much, much better than the U.S. and the U.K. have been for the past decade. As for mortgages, the percentage whose payments are 90 or more days past due is quite low, and even lower than the peaks at two different periods during the 90s. On top of that, the banks insure these mortgages to offset losses. Of course, 
this doesn't make endless borrowing right. Let me point out, first of all, the banks do not insure this. CMHC insures it, which means taxpayers insure it. It's just that the banks offload the insurance premium onto the client. But aren't, Moshe, aren't banks just doing what banks are supposed to do and aren't consumers just doing what consumers are supposed well, to do? I think they have diametrically opposed objectives. The bank wants to make sure that it's going to get paid back. And if it's not going to get paid back, that it charged a high enough interest rate while it was waiting so that it compensate for it. So the Absolutely. fellow that you mentioned was paying 22% while he was paying. He eventually defaulted. It could be that the interest rates that he paid were enough. So, I mean, there's an equilibrium there. But I think that overall, banks want to make sure that they get paid back. I think they make intelligent loans. They don't necessarily want to make sure that you retire in luxury. They don't want to make sure that you have a house that's fully furnished. They're perfectly content with you sitting in an empty house, but they want to get paid. And I think that's ultimately the challenge. When we take a look at all the other things Canadians should be doing with their paycheck, there may not be enough to make it through the life cycle. And that's what worries me. But as you look at this from a statistical point of view, as opposed to an anecdotal point of view, are people and banks essentially doing what they do? Yes, I think what we saw in... Um over the last decade was there was a study recently by the C.D. Howe Institute that talked about how a lot of this debt push has been the democratization of debt, that a lot of lower middle income people who didn't have access to debt before yes. now have ac access to it. I wouldn't want to cut those people off. I wouldn't want to say to a single mom coming home who has a see something on, you know, 50 percent off one day only, oh, not be me. able to do that. Really? You want to encourage a single Gail, mom to Gail, spend money she Gail. doesn't have? Gail, we don't say bite me on this program. We try to have a <laughs> little higher level of conversation. But anyway, make, you, Philip, your point is that your point has been made. And without saying bite me, is there something you can retort that would deal with that issue? Sure. How do we ever encourage anybody to live beyond their means and then turn around and decry the fact that they're not saving because that's exactly what the other flips the other side of this coin is we will bemoan the fact that canadians aren't saving they aren't planning for their future look how irresponsible they are but at the same time we encourage them to go out and buy those whimsical things and we know we know how the brain operates and how attractive it is to buy something new it gives us a certain percentage of the population is always going to have trouble a certain percentage are going to have trouble handling gambling, a certain percentage handling drugs and alcohol. So that doesn't mean we should cut off debt everyone. To gambling and alcohol. For some people it is. Okay. I'm but a very small percentage. And I'm not gonna put ninety five percent of the population in mandatory physical fitness classes because five percent uh, have weight problems. It's funny because that's exactly what the Ontario government did when it instituted required gym every single day for kids. That is true. Uh, can I just get a better understanding and uh, Okay, uh, Derek, we'll start with you on this. Not all debt is bad. There is some good debt. What's good debt versus bad debt? Well, you know, I think generally what we're talking about is that any debt which is used to invest in the future, like debt to, say, pursue a post-secondary education, that's good debt because there's going to be a return at the end of the road. Debt used to buy a home because you got an asset on the, on the other side of the balance sheet is good debt, and the hope is that over time that asset will appreciate in value. And a good part of the savings, we talk about very little savings nowadays. Canadians have been relying on gains in their home values to save for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that's an important point. The problem is that, of course, that's not assured that's going to continue. Well, as long as the market goes up, you're fine. That's right, and we know it'll go through ups and downs. It should go up over time, but, but I think that's generally what we're talking about. Now, I think the bottom line is too much of anything is bad, and you know, even if it's debt used to invest in the future, that you can go beyond your means, um, and uh, and then it uh, it, it can turn into bad debt. Okay. So. What's uh, do you want to make a distinction I, between I good debt and bad debt? It's, it's it's a little bit more difficult than it sounds to differentiate between good debt and bad debt. I mean, borrowing money to buy a house is okay, but what about furnishing the house? And what about furnishing the house with excessive furnishings that you don't really need? I like to differentiate between living within your current means and living within your lifetime means. There are individuals out there that are young that are uh, in medical school. They have a huge amount of debt, but you know that they're going to be doing very well at some point. Maybe they can live beyond their current month means because they're living within their life cycle means. There are individuals out there that may be able to afford it this month, but they'll never be able to afford it over their life. They should be scaling down. It's also about the interest rate. At 2% interest rate, some good debt can become bad debt and vice versa and the other way around. Borrowing a house uh, to buy a house at 11% interest rates may be a good idea, but the interest rate is too high. I think it's more subtle than just good and bad is what I'm hmm. saying. Would you agree, though, that a mortgage, generally speaking, if you can handle it, yes. would be considered good? Debt. And so that's exactly the distinction that has to be made. Can mm -hmm. you handle it? Because 
Mortgages typically have always been seen as good debt because you're building an asset, but in reality there are a lot of people out there who have gone and taken 100% of the asset as a mortgage. And then every time their asset appreciates, they roll their consumer debt that they're accumulating into their house. So in mm -hmm. fact, they're never paying that asset off. This is another very American phenomenon. We seem to be importing the worst from our American cousins. But not mortgage deductibility. But not mortgage yeah. deductibility. Would that be a terrible thing? To that would be here? a terrible thing. That would be like the, the icing on the cake for people to yeah. never pay off their mortgages. The the very low interest rates. I mean, there would be a tiny amount that they'd be able to deduct now in, in current interest rate environment. Yes. But I certainly agree with you. It would only encourage people to borrow more. Yes. That they couldn't necessarily And never pay afford. it off. Yeah. yeah. Philip, you wanted to say. The worst practice I saw in the U.S. and that we haven't imported here is things where people consciously abuse the debt. Uh, for example, liar's loans. Who was doing the liar, lying in those? It was the people applying for them. Ninja, I'd blame both. Uh, what were financial institutions, Sorry, ninja? ninja loans, no income, no job uh, loans? Yeah, right. You know, everyone's to blame in that one. Why is a financial institution giving a person with no job a loan? Why is that person with no income and no job applying for a loan? Well, excuse me. They have me, no intention of repaying. I would like to point out that right now, here in Canada, we do ninja loans. Every credit card given to a student at university who does not have a job is a ninja loan. It's a very small percentage of the total. Listen, you yeah. can talk about yeah. the excuses, but you can't say we don't yeah. have it if in fact we have it. If I were to walk into a financial institution loan, without not, a not job mortgage, and say, and, uh, can I please have a, a loan? Mm -hmm. I need a credit card. I don't have a job, but I need a credit card. You'd never give it to me. But a student who has no ex experience managing credit this is the first time they're doing it. They're allowed to dig themselves horrendous holes, and every time they keep making their minimum payments and their credit scores go up, they get sent more cards. But the assumption, I presume, is that if they get into trouble, their parents will bail them out. Isn't that what the Wrong credit assumption. card companies are Wrong assumption, on? because their parents aren't signed, so they're not legally liable. On top of which, do we not already agree that we have a financial literacy problem in this country? We do. Okay, so why are we assuming that customers have the wherewithal to be making the best decisions on their own without the proper kind of counseling and coaching? You know what, I jumped in there and said we do because, and we've done programs on this because we think people do, but am I right about this? We have a financial well, I, literacy I, I problem? Want to add that there's a, a lot of our prosperity can be sourced from all of the things that you dislike. Like. I mean, uh, we've reached this point in the economic cycle. The growth that we have is partially because of our ability to borrow borrow against buy. future human capital. There are individuals that abuse that, but I think there's some good sides to it that we're not seeing. I would much rather lend a university student some money than somebody off the street, because there's a higher probability that they're going to be able to repay. They're getting an education, they're likely to earn more income. I mean, but I, they I, have no income now, so how do they even they have qualify? Future, future income. I, I'd, I'd be delighted to lend a university student that's studying engineering at one of the best schools alone. I mean, obviously they're going to have a great job down the line. They'll be able to afford it. Going off the street randomly and lending someone who's 22 years old money, I'd be more concerned. So, And so this is where macroeconomics meets personal economics. Hmm. Because I am focused on personal economics and trying to help Canadians see that in order to be healthy financially, in order to be able to weather whatever ever economic storm blows up in their faces, they have to have a solid financial foundation while everybody else thinks it's okay that they borrow against money they may never earn. Let me just follow up with Derek though on that issue of financial literacy. Do your customers have it? Uh, not all of them, for sure. We know that. Uh, studies show, I mean, you look at uh, the number of Canadians that, uh, you know, even from an early stage, they never get the numeracy that they need to handle uh, a lot of the, uh, the products, the sheer number of products. And that's one thing I was going to add, is just convenience is one thing that Canadians have benefited from, because this whole life cycle hypothesis where you, you tend to go through periods of life, you need to borrow, ultimately you want to then invest and rack up the assets so you can retire. And I think a lot of the new credit innovations will help them do that. Now, you need to manage it successfully, which I guess gets back to this whole financial literacy. We know it's a big issue. And we know why the federal government had a task force on financial literacy, that we need to do something about it, that uh, Canadians need to get up to speed on a lot of these issues and it starts way back in, in primary school maybe secondary grade 8 where you could start introducing some courses but this is this is really consensus at this stage. Philip let me get you to, to uh, go back and use your StatsCan background for a second here on the issue of consumer debt because we pointed out we're at about 152 percent of household income debt levels right now. How does that compare with 10 years ago, 20 years ago? It's up significantly but I'm not sure debt income is a very good measure, frankly. It's the one, it's the starting point of most analyses, and 
as is usually the case, if your starting point is a little off, usually everything that follows is. So the debate that's evolving from that is a, a bit off center. Debt to income says if, when you're doing that, you're taking the stock of debt you accumulate over a lifetime, buying a home and so on, and you're comparing it to what I earned this year. Um, as somebody noted, if, if you ask somebody with uh, an income of 100,000, is, is it bad for you to have a mortgage of 150,000, which is what that ratio says, I think most people would go, What's, what's the problem here? Well, yeah. so you get into trouble, not with the overall debt to income ratio, but with the distribution of debt. And there we have a lot less data on. That refers to what? That refers to, debt? yes, there are, where, who is holding that debt? If it's a bunch of high income earners in Alberta, you wouldn't be so worried. If it's a bunch of young people who have, uh, are starting out in life and have a lot shakier finances, it's going to be a different story. So yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Go, Go ahead. I, I just think that you mentioned age, and I think age is something that doesn't get adjusted here. I mean, somebody that's 72 years old with 150 debt to income ratio, that's very scary. Somebody that's 35 years old, that may be a very manageable number. So unfortunately, those numbers aren't adjusted for age. I think younger people can handle more debt. Maybe psychologically, they have difficulties with it, but their human capital, they have 40 years of wages ahead of them. They can afford to borrow a little bit against it. But it, it depends on what they're borrowing for. Right. And this Absolutely. is at the core of what's wrong yeah. with the way people are borrowing right now. Yeah. When they get a credit card and the, uh, the limit on the credit card keeps going up, and that means they can go to the mall and buy more dresses. I mean, I worked with one girl who got a credit card with a small balance, a small credit limit, some $100. I said to her, how long did it take you to run it out? One day. She blew it out in one day, okay? Because so much is focused on the minimum payment. Well, we all know that the minimum payment is an anchor. If you took the minimum payment off the statement, this has been researched, take the minimum payment off the statement, people pay more. You put the minimum payment on there, that's all they pay because right. that will keep them in debt longer, that will make them pay more interest. But there's been a, go ahead. I was Jeff. just going to say one of the interesting findings we've seen, we've looked at the Ipsos Reid data. We don't have a lot of good data on debt in Canada and this is one of the challenges, but Ipsos Reid has a survey about 5,000 Canadians and one of the interesting findings is that a good part of the debt growth is Canadians 60 and over. And it's, again, it kind of throws the traditional life cycle theory, in a sense, on his head because these are older Canadians. They're supposed to be paying down debt, heading into retirement. Now, I think what's going on is because returns on, uh, on bonds are so low that they're using it as a way to diversify their assets. They're borrowing to buy real estate. I think some, certainly some of the strength in, in residential real estate markets is, would be older Canadians investing, maybe buying for their children. But I think it's, it's quite astounding, and I think there's probably not enough press given to that. Point. Moshe, I want to follow up with you on this, the, the cultural angle to this story. Because once upon a time, probably many of our parents or grandparents here, would you know, the notion of going into huge debt to pay for a car or something like that, they wouldn't have done it, right? They saved the $2,000 in cash it would have cost to buy that car, and then they bought it. Debt was kind of poison. Nowadays, we're big spenders. We don't think anything of going into debt. How did that, that's, that's a cultural change. It's a mindset change. A generational Why one. did it, yeah, how did yeah. it happen? I mean, you were mentioning co-signing on a credit card. About 25 years ago when I was in university, I got my first credit card offer, but I needed somebody to co-sign. Yep. I asked my grandfather at the time, would you be willing to co-sign the loan? And uh, it was about two hours of yelling about how bad <laughs> debt is and how you should live within yeah. your means. And uh, I didn't ask anymore. <laughs> and maybe it was a good thing I didn't get the credit card. But it very much is a generational thing. The whole idea of spending money that you don't own to consume something today is very much something that we've gotten accustomed to now that 30 or 40 years ago wasn't done, possibly because it wasn't easy to do it. Didn't exist. I mean, exist. I'm not really sure that my grandfather would have said no to a 2% loan uh, at that time. It just wasn't available. So right. because it wasn't available, they kind of got accustomed to living within their means. So you're, uh, no disrespect to your grandfather, but they may not be any purer than this generation. Totally it's just not. That I agree. Fewer options. Fewer yep. options. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Fewer cow patties. Uh, Can fewer I say what? cow patties? Fewer cow patties. Cow patties. Oh, I see what you're doing there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least that was G-rated, I think. Which is <laughs> unlike some of what comes out of that mouth. <laughs> okay. Um, should the Bank of Canada be raising interest rates to tamp down on the avaricious attitude by Canadians to seeming to want to spend more than they have. Absolutely not. You I'm say sorry, no, Moshe. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, that is the last absolutely not. Yeah, that, is, no. that is not the concern. I mean, I That's don't think Mark Carney should be sitting there saying, ooh, Canadians have too much debt, let's raise the temperature. Yep. I think there are many other macroeconomic factors that he has to take into account. We are not living on an island somewhere. We are a very, very small part of a very large economic environment around the world. I think that there are many other instruments at the disposal of the government to help manage debt. Interest rates are probably the fifth or sixth on that list. That Absolutely. would be my view. Derek? 
I agree. I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, I think one of the next phases, they've already tightened the mortgage rules the federal government has through CMHC on three occasions, and that's beginning to look like it's beginning to restrain the amount of debt growth. We've already seen debt growth come down quite a bit in the last 12 months. Mortgage credit growth is still running at about 8% on an annual basis. What's interesting, other forms of consumer credit are well down from their peak, certainly well down from the trend rates pre-recession. Credit cards are in decline on a year-over-year -year basis. The people are using them, they're just paying down the balances on a regular basis. So some of that, I think, could be chalked up to what the CMHC and the federal government has been doing to lower, to tighten up some of the mortgage rules. The next phase, I think, is going to be uh, you know, the bank regulator looking at new rules on lines of credit, going up to, say, six, allowing banks to lend 60% uh, loan to value on a line of credit rather than 80%. Uh, that kind of thing. So that could kick in as early as next year. So it's still being debated. Now, if that doesn't work, then you have the, the interest rate at your disposal. I think rates probably will be going up by then, but it's a blunt instrument. It hits the whole economy. It's not the best one. You can target it much better through regulation changes, and that's the process they're going through. Philip, do you agree there are five or six things that probably ought to be done before you get to interest rates? 100 percent. That. Um, uh, Sorry, interest rates shouldn't be. Interest rates at? No, no. Uh, <laughs> interest rates should not be used checking. to target right one now. sector. <laughs> there are other ways yeah. of targeting a sector. Uh, mm -hmm. Why would you risk, for example, raising the dollar and hurting our export sector to rein in another sector's mm -hmm. excess? Yeah. Uh, it's not part the of the mandate. Rate, rate, no, the interest rate is meant to manage inflation. That's what the interest rate is meant to do. And, and you know, he's still within his parameters on inflation. Although the way inflation gets measured, we get hit harder, uh, regular folk because it's food and gas where we're seeing the majority of inflation, and that's mm -hmm. well up over 3%. Uh, but overall, inflation is under the 3 but, and so he doesn't yeah. have to raise rates but, yet. Gail, one thing you reminded of us, I think, last week, this Bank of Canada governor, is that you've got price stability, which is inflation, and that's really their ultimate end game. But uh, financial stability is, is every bit as important to achieving price stability. And this is where you get into still this question mark about whether he would, in fact, use higher rates if other means don't slow it down. Right. And uh, again, I don't think we're going to get there because if things play out as we hope, then, uh, you know, the economy will continue to grow. Rates will come up gradually, allowing Canadians time to adjust. All in fact, you guys have to do to is start lending the way you used to lend when you were good lenders. What does that mean? It means checking a person's character. How long have they been working? Do they have a stable residence history? Do they have a stable job history? Checking a person's capacity. Do they have the wherewithal to pay the loan back? Is there some collateral that can be taken to secure this loan? There are a whole bunch of factors that come into this. The five C's of credit. I wrote the training program, so I know it's there. The thing is, is that it's gone out the window because it's so much easier just to check a credit score and say, oh, look, he's an 837. Give him all the credit he can use. I, I need to let him respond and defend himself if he cares to. Yeah, no, I mean, the last time I checked, we still go through rigorous processes. Now, fine, the system isn't perfect, I admit, and this is an ongoing thing. Uh, as part of the regulations, they may look at, at certain other of these issues uh, for the upcoming proposals that are being discussed at the moment. But, you know, again, I think I go back to the World Economic Forum. I go back to credit uh, de analysts of banks. They still think, by and large, we're in good shape. They do worry about the amount of debt, and that's why we're even here today. But it's not a crisis in the making. Did anybody see the crisis coming in America? Or did that just come and hit everybody over the head with a soggy wet arm? Our banks aren't like their banks, though. Of course not, sweetheart. They're not, though. Yeah. They're not, though. Household debt in the U.S. It's was true. accelerating. Agreeing, aren't you? What I'm saying Sorry, is, is that how will we down. know until we hit a point where the wall comes up and a few people run into it. And then we see people who lose their jobs. Interest rates only have to go up a couple of points for industry to start slowing down. And people lose their jobs, then how do they make their payments? We know almost everybody out there that has a mortgage needs two incomes to pay that mortgage off. One person only has to lose a couple of shifts a week and now they're into their credit cards to buy groceries. If you just shut off the credit, then we're going to be in recession. That's the problem. So I, I certainly wouldn't, uh, you know, tell the banks just cut off uh, household credit because of. But I mean, going back to this whole 2.99 2 mortgage thing, it's interesting that the banks are often accused of colluding. Uh, the fact of the matter, it's a very competitive system, and that's what led to this. I think some of the banks weren't particularly happy when one of the banks led the way on, on both times it happened. And the fact is that we're, it's a very competitive market. If we don't match, uh, the first mover, then we lose market lose share. Business, and absolutely. that's what I call competition. It's not collusion. Okay, Philip, sorry, I interrupted you. I just wouldn't want it to leave the impression where Gail left the discussion that we're pushing credit out the door at ever-accelerating rates. 
Credit growth uh, peaked in 2007. It's been decelerating steadily since. You're asking for banks and financial institutions to act in a more responsible, restrained manner. I think the governor of the Bank of Canada wants that. And I think the message is getting through to both financial institutions and borrowers, and that's why we're seeing debt and growth I agree slow with you. down. And I agree with you. However, a lot of damage has already been done. And there are a lot of people out there that are this high, okay? Well, they're, they're sticking their noses up trying to get a breath. Moshe, let me go to the flip side of that, is which we saw in the United States a considerable amount of criticism of the banks when they refused to lend enough. They took all that money they got from TARP. They ended up buying up a lot of their competitors. They didn't loan it. The credit basically froze. And the real economy suffered as a result. Now, we can't let that happen here either, can well, we? That's the, the paradox of thrift. If everybody behaves like Gale and they don't spend any money unless they have it, the economy collapses. We need some of your customers to help keep the economy going. <laughs> People that live beyond their means and buy things that they can't afford and don't need so that we get this economy to grow from where it is right now. If everybody stopped and only spent the money at the end of the paycheck, I mean, I'm not a chief economist at a bank, but I don't neither think that's going to be very more good. More. Neither is yeah. he. He's just yeah. the deputy chief economist. <laughs> In waiting. But that's, In waiting. But that's a couple of minutes left here. Let's hit on this. Is he right that if we all acted as thriftily as you perhaps want us to, the real economy in some respects shuts down and that's well, even worse? What we have is a consumer economy that is not built on spending the money we make. It's built on spending money we haven't got. So when I'm carrying a $10,000 line of credit or I consolidate $40,000 to my mortgage of credit card debt, that's money I haven't earned yet. And so we should not be allowed to spend that money. That is because that's the antithesis of saving. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how much you save. If you're carrying debt on the other side of your balance sheet, you have nothing. Okay, so if what we want is a healthy economy, then I don't know where we draw the line. Like, I'm not the economist, okay? I can't tell you where we draw the line. All I know is that good sense says you can't spend money you don't have. And when you spend more money than you make, ultimately down the road you're going to pay the price. Because if you get sick, if you get a divorce, mm -hmm. if you're widowed, if your child gets sick, if anything like that happens to you, you're up a creek without a paddle. And you do have to pay yourself, right, Moshe? You do. Got to pay yourself. You I mean, Set aside some savings. We're not yeah. saving enough, are we? If you actually add up all the ratios, so you can put 40% towards a house and you have to pay 12% in uh, property and this, you add up all the amount that you should be saving for retirement, you're at about 130%, <laughs> right? I mean, 18% RRSPs, 45% to the bank. But the 18% for RRSPs yeah. are only for the idiots who didn't start when they were in their 20s. Because if mm -hmm. you start in your 20s, it's only 6%. Mm -hmm. If you wait until you're in your 40s, then it's 18%. So I'm out there flog in the message, start in your 20s, and then you only have to save 6%. Right. Now you have money to spend. You're sending the money to the banks on the asset side, not the liability side. Absolutely. Because yeah. at least you can take it back when you're ready. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, when you come out of your shell someday, you are going to be a great TV guest. <laughs> right, I just want you to know you. that. Yeah, looking forward. And congratulations. You got through that whole half hour without dropping the F-bomb once. I'm really impressed. Thank you very much, Gail. My pleasure. <laughs> uh, Philip Cross, Senior Fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute. Thanks to you. Derek Burleton, Vice President and Deputy. Chief Economist at the TD Bank Financial Group, Moshe Malevsky, York University and the IFID Center, and Gail Vazoxley, broadcaster, author of Debt Free Forever. Thanks, GVO. My pleasure. And to everybody else. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.